Alright, so the Sandown 500 has just been and gone. Another one in the books, and especially given that the track's, you know, on the verge of closing, it's all but guaranteed. Um, you know, it's nice to have another Sandown 500, because you never know, next year might very well be the last one. One thing we've been missing a little bit is just like that precursor to Bathurst. Now, obviously, COVID happened, you know, things happened that was out of our control. Couldn't exactly do a lot of events during COVID time. But now that it's over, and even last year, we should have been able to come back here. But it's good to finally be back for an endurance round. And man, what a round it was, actually. It had a fair amount of action. It had a fair amount of action. Um, there was some lulls in excitement. There was some moments where it kind of just died down a little bit. You know, towards the sort of second, third, or third quarter of the race, it was quite a sort of dead race. It did start to sort of draw back, you know, towards being a genuinely exciting fight for the last, you know, few laps with Feeney tire saving and everybody else trying to catch him ahead. Um, that was something I was looking forward to, but then we obviously had the late race safety car. Um, which brings me to my point. Fucking time certainty. Again. Again. Time certainty has, like... Sand down and time certainty go hand in hand. And it's a problem that plagues a lot of supercars races. It's a problem that plagues a lot of them. Um, you know, there's multiple times a year where time certainty comes up. And it's never a popular thing. I have been drinking through the race, by the way. So if my driving is a little bit off, that's probably why. Time certainty, man. We can't escape it. Especially here. You know, it happens multiple times a year. And it's just, it's infuriating because today we kind of got robbed of a grandstand finish for P2 with um, Brody Kostecki and Shane Van Gisbergen. But as well as that, you know, Matt Payne was coming back for fifth on Andre Heimgartner and they were both closing on on Will Brown. And I get it, old man grasping at straws, yelling at Cloud, you know, Facebook boomer stuff, you know, that's neither here nor there. But at the same time, it's one of those things that genuinely kills the excitement of a race. Just having time certainty, or even hearing time certainty. Hearing those words just kind of... It puts a damper on the race, no matter how exciting it is. And it sucks. It sucks. Because it could very well be, you know, planned around. This stuff doesn't have to be an issue. Now, obviously, there was an incident just up at this corner here. Um, just at this little right-hand kink. In the Super 2 race that kind of delayed things because they had to repair the wall. Um, the race was pushed back by 15 minutes and as a result they were able to push back the time certainty by I think it was seven or maybe even eight minutes. If there was two more safety cars during that race and we started at that at a normal time we still would have hit time certainty and the estimated repairs on that wall were an hour. If that had have taken an hour we would not have gotten you know a good portion of that race. The race would have been ruined. And it shouldn't be happening at a marquee event like this. Sandown is one of... It's probably the second highest tier of event on the Supercars calendar when it's an Enduro. Maybe you could argue season opener, season finisher. You know, they're sort of on another level as well. But Sandown, you know, it's an Enduro. That in and of itself has a higher value than any other race on this series. And it's not like... It's hard to put into words, but they know, they have restrictions from the Dendenon Council that they can't run engines past 6pm on a Sunday. Which, sure, that's fair enough. You probably don't want to go much later anyway because, you know, it's sunset. Outside, it's starting to get pretty dark. It had become dangerous conditions for drivers to be driving in anyway. Sure, they have other events as well on the undercard, but, like, they can plan around it and provide, you know, more than a 15 minute buffer towards the maximum time that they can run cars for. It's just infuriating to see it happen again and again and again. And if there's a Sandown event next year, there's, you know, a good to fair chance that it'll probably happen again. Other than that though, the racing was pretty exciting. Obviously, it was very Camaro dominated at the front. Uh, Mustangs really didn't have a say in the matter. Uh, obviously, that's mostly due to the fact that Tanda's wheel fell off in the most bizarre fashion and took out Waters as a result, um, just jumping up on his wing. I didn't expect to see a Craig Lowndes reference from that, but 
we got it. Um, as well as that, like, you know, there was Randall who was out because of the steering. Um, DJR are just slow. They're just slow. They're not where they want to be. And I feel like there was another Ford. Oh, yeah, Mossett as well. Mossett had a few issues early on. Poor old Mozzie. Um, he just got rammed up the rear a few times and they had to keep coming in to repair that before they ended up deciding to just cut it all off because it was better. So, you know, there was no pace there and Percat had issues anyway. Percat had issues as well that were known before the race, which is, you know, it's becoming the norm for that second car to just not be running at full capacity. Oh! Kept it out of the wall. There was a lot going for it. There was a lot of action. These cars were racing quite nicely with each other. There was a lot of, you know, obviously when you get people to jump in the cars who don't drive them all the time, who aren't full-time drivers, there is going to be that little bit of ex inexperience. But by and large, there wasn't, like the crop of drivers that we have currently, as well as the co-drivers, are currently some of the best that you could have in supercars. It's amazing how good they are at avoiding incidents and how safe they drive. There are only two safety cars. One was obviously for that wheel detachment and the second was for a issue that wasn't driver related. So that's pretty impressive. Um, the brake caliper changes as well. They were played up to be, you know, a big deal, but only a few cars took them. They weren't all they were cracked up to be, which is quite a shame. I was excited to see, you know, how teams would adapt to that and whether that would be race defining but it ended up being just a non-event you know the only driver up the front who took the brake caliper change was Payne and well let's talk about Payne shall we he did such a good job this weekend you know Estre as well Estre first time in the supercar this weekend um, you know the Frenchman he's very good at endurance racing got a great standing start despite the fact he's always doing rolling starts good performance from him Great performance from Payne. It was just such a weekend for him. You know, if it wasn't for the fact that they... The blue flag cars, the lap cars on that last restart, they really didn't move out of the way. And I thought there was a rule that, you know, that supercars moves the cars. Obviously, I was misinformed on that. I just misremembered it. Fuck, nearly slid into the wall there. But I thought they were moved. I thought, you know, the lap cars got their lap back or they were forced towards the back. Obviously, I've misremembered things. That one's on me. But it just sucks because Payne was the fastest of that backpack. He was doing such a good job. He would have caught Heimgartner. And given the pace at the end, he definitely would have beat Brown. It's just a shame that he didn't have that opportunity, in my opinion. Heimgartner put in a good performance as well. You know, Brock Feeney winning is such a legendary drive for him. Jamie Moon Cup becoming six time Sandown winner. You know, that was a great start from him as well. He really helped get them into a place where they could win, and Brock Feeney just capitalised. The tyre saving at the end really paid in dividends after that safety car. It was a good performance all around. Shane and Gisberg and Stanaway driving their way back up. Great performance from them. Stanaway, especially, you know, really measured drive, driving back through the field. He did the. He did a lot of drive through the field, pit, have to drive back through the field again. Um, but he did a really good job of it. And then obviously Shane, he caught a lot of time. Um, he was stuck behind a lot of traffic as well, which kind of sucks when you're fighting for that win or you're fighting for that podium. It kind of sucks that you can get stuck behind there, but that's a consequence of his poor qualifying, I guess. He's only got himself to blame. The wild cards, they were all right. Um, Craig Lowndes nearly ended his own race on another car. That was quite something to watch. Goddard did well, given that they were in the broken chassis as well. They very well could have been in a higher spot. Love and Kostecki, they put in a good race. I don't think it was anything to write home about. It's a good experience for Aaron Love, who's probably going to get the call up next year. But, you know, good effort from a rookie. Now we move onwards to Bathurst. And I think the biggest thing to come from this is just the sheer value of finishing the race if you're in that top four spot. If you're any of the Erebus or Red Bull boys, finishing the race is what comes primarily first. You do not want to DNF. You really don't want to play the risk game. 
Bathurst is one that you want to win. Don't get me wrong. I think Brown, Kostecki, they'll be trying so hard for it. SVG would have been a fairy tale to win on his last full-time season in supercars. Feeney, first Bathurst win as well. I think he would love to win. But at this point, they've got to think championship as well, which really provides an exciting prospect for drivers who are outside of that championship battle, but also have pace. Drivers like Moss, drivers like waters drivers like the um, msr boys who've been doing really well this year as well by the way and obviously we get simona de silvestro returning that's good i'm fairly certain we've got next year in the bag for sandown but it's really going to be a shame to lose this track i mean it always throws up exciting racing it always throws up exciting racing it's such a fun sort of circuit to watch it's such a like such a tight and complex circuit but also it's so fast and flowing and it's just, oh, there's nothing like it, man. There's nothing like it. And to lose this to some pretty averagely developed housing is going to be heartbreaking. You just know it's going to be like cookie cutter houses that are very inefficient. There is those tire issues, a lot of just conserving the tires and their steep drop off. As that did show in Sandown as well. There, as Craig Lowndes said, there was just such a steep drop off after like 15, 16 laps, you know. But, you know, Bathurst, it's, it's such a great track. I can't wait. If you enjoyed the video, please do be sure to leave a thumbs up and consider subscribing if you haven't already. I have a few more videos planned throughout the week. Um, I do have another video on Sandown plan. Whether I get around to making it or not, we'll see. Thank you all for watching, and I'll catch you guys next time.